Welcome everyone. Thank you very much for joining us today for the launch of ITU's flagship regulatory report, Trends in Telecommunication Reform. This report is produced by ITU each year and is widely recognised as the definitive uh, global snapshot of the regulatory environment worldwide. We're delighted to have with us today two special guests who are both regulatory experts. We have Mario Manjewitz, who's Chief of Infrastructure Enabling Environment and E-Applications, and Nancy Sundberg, she's Senior Program Officer in the Regulatory and Market Environment Division, and it's her unit who organises ITU's annual Global Symposium for Regulators. Thank you very much, both of you, for joining us. Uh, let's have a look at the content of this year's report. Let's start with you, Nancy. Could you give us just a, a, a brief overview, sum up the main thrust of the yes. report this year? Yes. Thanks, Sarah. I think that perhaps mo the most important finding of um, finding is that ICT regulation now has moved much higher uh, up the list of the national priorities in many of national priorities in many countries. And the government uh, worldwide now acknowledge the, uh, the vital role that um, technology plays in uh, their uh, national prosperity and in getting them into international competitiveness. So what we all often say is that ICT networks are the backbone of today's society and uh, of just all the modern services that are being uh, provided in, in a digital uh, environment. If you think of banking, commerce, and to the delivery of uh, public uh, services, just like education and health. So government now, they understand that getting the right mix of regulatory um, um, regulation has a huge impact on ICT rollout and on uh, service costs to the local uh, population and to businesses as well. So um, in recognition of this, 160 countries have now um, established a separate regulatory agency. But the big challenge uh, for these agencies is now uh, to find ways of uh, managing uh, increasingly complex and uh, transborder markets because the environment is changing and changing very rapidly, as we've seen. Mario, that's uh, indeed the theme of this year's report, uh, transnational globalised markets for ICT goods and services. Could you tell us what that would mean for the work of a regulator? Well, it certainly implies that uh, the regulatory work in the ICT sector is increasingly complex. It's becoming more and more complex. So these transnational players, coupled with the regional networks that are being used to deliver uh, services and content uh, the, that uh, not necessarily belong to, to what we traditionally call uh, telecommunication mm -hmm. services, uh, made, makes uh, this very challenging. So on one hand, we have this convergence between the broadcasting and the telecommunications. On the other hand, we have these new applications and new services, for instance, the cloud services. Uh, we have there issues of ownership, issues of uh, privacy that were not there before. And uh, for instance, in the cloud services, you the data is not situated in the same country or the service is not even situated uh, or given provided in the same country that you are uh, uh, hiring it. So obviously these transnational issues are making this uh, regulatory environment uh, more complex. Does it mean that uh, a national focus for regulators is effectively outdated? Do they all have to be looking further afield or is there still a role for a nationally focused policy? Well, uh, certainly the national regulatory framework is key in order to ensure that we have a level playing field uh, that will promote uh, competition and that will foster the rollout of networks and, and services. But of course, there is a, a change of the game, let's mm. say, for the regulators, because they have to also consider a transnational uh, perspective. Mm. So uh, the, the national networks are key for the development of the sector and of, of the socioeconomic uh, aspects of the country, but these networks will be much less uh, useful if they are not uh, strongly connected to, to other, uh, let's say, international uh, networks and regional networks. As well, uh, from the spectrum uh, perspective, uh, if we have a harmonized uh, spectrum uh, plan for a region, then we will be able to accommodate much more this uh, boom of the mobile services, including the mobile broadband. 
Nancy, we're going to go back to you. I'd just um, like to tell all of our participants we will be inviting them to uh, ask questions via the chat pod on the Adobe Connect interface or you can send them in via Twitter. But let's uh, go back to the report. Any other yeah. key findings that you would yes, uh, I think like to summarise? So yes, one of the main uh, points that really comes out is that um, in future ICT policies will need to focus uh, even more on uh, closely on consumer needs and consumer concerns. And this is uh, certainly clearly shown through the, um, the, the research we've done on cloud computing, data protection and privacy issues. As the, w as the, the regulatory environment is getting more and more complex, consumer protection becomes an even increasing issue. Is social and media affecting that? I mean, are you finding uh, pressure on operators uh, via social channels if they may be mm -hmm. criticised or...? Yes, it certainly uh, plays a, a, bi a big role. What we're witnessing now is like a, completely a complete change in, um, in consumer behaviours, but also a complete change in uh, business practices. And what we do see is that increasing uh, transparency is really one uh, uh, important and major goal. And um, one of my colleagues just told me this morning, maybe the, the key regulatory, regulatory tool today might be transparency. Mm -hmm. And uh, what we've seen is w uh, an obvious area where um, this is important is in mobile roaming. Mm. For example, we saw that the new provisions to increase price transparency uh, for mobile um, calls were agreed in uh, Dubai in mm. December during um, the Wicked meeting, um, where new the new international telecommunication regulations uh, were uh, uh, adopted. Yeah. And what we now need to see is how operators will now implement strategies that are going to help consumers determine exactly how much they are paying when they are uh, traveling abroad. And this is not ju this doesn't apply just for voice services, but also uh, increasingly uh, for data. And uh, I think we all know of friends that have uh, come back from uh, holidays from and uh, from trips abroad and have had to face enormous. Uh, bill for, for data download. I think some people don't even realize that they're Ex downloading. It's exactly. not sometimes yeah. this happens. They don't even know that uh, they, they, are, uh, access they were accessing uh, the internet. So this is uh, certainly a big issue. And also what we see is that as machine-to-machine -machine communications and uh, automatic update of web uh, feeds and instant access to online news and videos are increasingly becoming the norm, the, the industry is going to have to find um, a way to accommodate the need for, uh, to make a good return from the services they deliver uh, with consumers' new usage uh, patterns and new lifestyles and new habits. Mario, um, could we talk a little bit, just to explain to the people who've joined us on the webinar, um, the, the, the origins of this report. This comes out of the Global Symposium for Regulators. It's mm -hmm. one of ITU's um, most popular, most successful events, I would say, uh, has a very, very loyal community of policymakers and regulators and takes place uh, every year. This uh, report is effectively the result of the three days uh, discussion during that and it's usually quite an intense and frank uh, debate. Um, could you tell us why was the, the GSR set up? Uh, who is it pitched at and, and, and what are its aims? Why did we mm -hmm. establish it? Sure. Well, the GSR, uh, the Global Symposium for Regulators, or GSR mm -hmm. as we call it for short, um, started in 2000. And the idea was to gather all the regulators around the world in order for them to discuss the issues of concern and to share experiences and to come up with a set of uh, best practices that they would agree upon uh, that would guide the work of the regulators uh, in, the, in the various topics that they were discussing. So at that time uh, there were not so many regulators around the world. Uh, we have gone uh, from uh, 40 to 160 today uh, and uh, this gathering has continued to be the preferred uh, meeting point of the regulators in order to share among peers uh, the concerns they have, the difficulties they have, many of the topics we've been discussing and the challenges they pose to regulators. And uh, by uh, sharing experiences and exchanging uh, uh, points of view, they get to a set of best practice guidelines, as we call them, that are issued at the end of the event, that are agreed upon all regulators, and that although they are not uh, binding, for anyone, I mean, they provide a good uh, guide 
for all regulators, mainly for the new ones, uh, the, the ones that are being set up that are not uh, as experienced, uh, but uh, for all, uh, in terms of uh, how to do about uh, important topics. So this year, the, the we will have the 13th edition of the GSR, and it will be in Poland, in Warsaw, uh, from the 3rd to the 5th of July. And the main topic of the event is the fourth uh, generation regulation. So just to show how the uh, regulatory framework has evolved, that we are in such a short time frame uh, already in what is considered the fourth uh, generation of regulatory measures, uh, mainly to um, foster broadband uh, to all, uh, both fixed and mobile broadband. That, the, the, that conference normally sees a very rich level of debate, if I could say, mm -hmm. and I think that must be partly because it's a peer-to-peer -peer discussion. It's quite a, um, a very experienced community of people working in the same field facing similar challenges. Absolutely. And it started as a peer-to-peer as -peer discussion and in a framework that was, let's say, closed uh, to them. So they felt confident enough to share their, their concerns and the, their experiences, good or bad. Um, but as uh, time evolved, uh, we, we faced uh, increasing pressure from the private sector mm -hmm. uh, for them to be part of the dialogue. So after consultation with the regulators, then we agreed on uh, devoting part of the time of the event to a dialogue between the regulators and the private sector. So that part of the event, we call it GRID for Global Regulators Industry Dialogue. So we have industry leaders that are coming uh, for the first two days of the event and they are uh, engaging in this dialogue with the regulators and then we go to the classical or the traditional uh, let's say closed uh, part for the regulators only so um, it has evolved in that sense but uh, we think in a, in a positive way because of course the regulators cannot be in a vacuum so they have to be uh, surrounded by the uh, service providers and the other members of the industry and probably in the future, also the consumers will have a, s <laughs> a say, <laughs> I imagine. I'm happy to, to say that uh, the uh, first day of the GSR is open to media and to analysts. I would very much encourage those of you joining us today to come to that event uh, this year in Warsaw, as Mario said. Uh, very, very interesting debate. Uh, we have a great program and uh, anyone who would like more information, please uh, just uh, get in touch with me. Let's go back to Nancy for the moment though uh, and look at some of the uh, more in-depth uh, key topics mm -hmm. that this report focuses mm -hmm. on. What are the key areas? So um, to answer some of the pressing needs of regulators, uh, we've, uh, and to try to bring a, uh, yeah, ex 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 an exchange of uh, experiences and to draw best practices on uh, really key uh, regulatory issues regulators are facing today. We've um, decided last year to uh, address the issues of net neutrality mm -hmm. and uh, traffic uh, measurement measures, uh, traffic management measures, sorry. Mm. What are the drive, uh, the factors that are driving their use and uh, the regulatory approaches that have been taken uh, by the different countries. Uh, we've lo we're looking at spectrum policy for future mobile growth, uh, mm. looking at the high level principles. Uh, that underlie an effective uh, policy making. Uh, we've, um, lo we're looking at international mobile roaming prices and best practices. We're also looking at global and regional IP interconnection and cloud computing, looking at uh, cloud computing regulation, but also looking at another aspect of cloud, uh, of cloud uh, services, which is data protection and uh, privacy in the cloud. And uh, in this report, we also we um, start with uh, the in an introduction chapter that sets the scene on what are the latest regulatory and uh, market trends. Mm -hmm. Let's look at the net neutrality issue because that debate's been ongoing for some time and it doesn't look like mm -hmm. it's going away. From the discussions at last year's GSR uh, in Sri Lanka, do you think what some people would call a multi-tier internet mm -hmm. um, where better services are available for those who can afford to pay more, is that an inevitable model for future uh, web access and if it is what does that mean for consumers and for global internet mm -hmm. um, uptake access mm -hmm. I, th I think it is uh, we're already seeing it today mm. it is inevitable as it is uh, happening in for other services and the provision of other services but i think the main uh, issue here is to ensure that um, operators and uh, service providers um, do not 
try to uh, um, block or downgrade uh, the traffic and by using uh, the traffic management practices that may be uh, that uh, consumers may not be aware of, mm -hmm. and that it by doing so they will um, restrain access to There's the internet. There's a risk that and operators may make the lower level packages r rather uh, kludgy. Exactly to try to, to, to encourage people to, to move up to, to move a more up to uh, yes to move up and to um, to bring to go to the next uh, let's say um, subscription mm -hmm. level, mm -hmm. and, and and this is something that uh, regulators may need to be uh, cautious of and uh, to be a. Uh, and this is again where the issue of transparency is really important. And it is really important that uh, consumers are informed, but that also they can get access to what are some of these P's, some of these quality of services that are the basic requirements. So operators so would be required to report yearly, uh, let's imagine yes. a scenario where they would be required to support, uh, to report yearly on the kinds of uh, uh, management practices, mm -hmm. uh, policies that they use, and maybe even the software and uh, the the KPIs mm -hmm. and whatever, so that so consumers that could consumers can understand what they are buying and what are they getting for the the kind of service they they um they are looking for, and this is really also to ensure that everybody can get access to the internet, but at reasonable uh, under reasonable and fair uh, terms and uh, conditions, and that they are not downgraded because of uh, some uh, tra traffic management uh, practices that would be um, at the at their at their detriment, but to to just for the um, the benefit of the of the operators to uh, generate more revenues. Uh, there are some questions coming through now, but I'm just going to ask Mario to, to talk quickly on um, on spectrum policy because this area is always mm -hmm. a highly contentious one. We always hear mobile <laughs> operators uh, crying out for more spectrum, uh, and we're probably on the brink of a new paradigm shift. I know ITU has, has finished pretty much the standardization of next generation mobile, so the IMT advanced um, platform that would see uh, mobile broadband speeds move up to uh, effectively one gigabit per second, um, that will inevitably put more pressure on limited spectrum. Uh, what will that mean? We already have a spectrum crunch in, even in some developed countries, I think anyone who's traveled to New York understands that, it's, mm -hmm. it's a difficult environment already. How are we going to cope with the new demands of mobile broadband? Absolutely. Well. Uh, the pressure on spectrum availability will continue. I mean, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's here to stay. Uh, of course, uh, it, it is not only, uh, let's say, because of the use of mobile services as we know them, but also because of the increasing use of machine-to-machine uh, -machine communications, over-the-top services like uh, VoIP, uh, and uh, in the increase, uh, increased use of uh, cloud services, for instance. So the expectation is that the data traffic uh, will um, grow 18-fold uh, from right. today mm -hmm. to 2016. So obviously the, the pressure on the, on the spectrum availability will continue. So for the time being, uh, there are two measures that are being taken until the next WRC, uh, the World Radio Communication, takes place. One is to uh, provide the spectrum management best practices and to try to, okay. uh, let's say, uh, convince uh, regulators to use them more and more, uh, like uh, the spectrum reforming, spectrum mm. reuse, uh, liberalization of, of uh, spectrum. Uh, these, uh, these measures can ease the, 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 the need for, for available spectrum. And also, it, in terms of uh, spectrum licensing, to try to go to more agile and market-oriented uh, uh, mechanisms uh, for licensing, and not those bureaucratic-based uh, uh, mm -hmm. procedures that took so so long. So this kind of uh, you know auctioning and uh, uh, in-band uh, migration and uh, spectrum sharing, uh, this kind of uh, licensing mechanisms that are more agile and that can respond better to the demands of the market. If we were to favor an auction, do we not risk pushing the cost of price up as we, we saw with the 3G licenses? People paid a, a fortune to get mm -hmm. hold of that spectrum and it must have had an impact on the cost of services eventually and maybe is still impacting the cost of services. Um, is that not a concern? It is, uh, but I think that we have learned from the experience of that time uh, and uh, now the, the, the people are mar much more cautious 
on the on the business uh, model that they will use for the auctioning it's also a way of uh, really uh, let's say um, making sure that spectrum usage uh, responds to demand or to a real need mm -hmm. and not if, y if, if spectrum is uh, granted for free uh, then you risk you run the risk of people uh, accumulating or keeping mm -hmm. chunks of spectrum that are not used just in case yeah, they exactly. can sell it later so on or it's a yeah. way of <laughs> yes <laughs> yes Mm. What about uh, the next World Radio Communication Conference? As, as many uh, on the webinar would know, it's ITU that handles the global allocation of spectrum to mm -hmm. different services. The next Radio Comms Conference comes up in 2015. Will we see new allocations, do you think, at that conference for mobile cellular? Absolutely, no doubt about it. It's already uh, taking care in the agenda. There are even two agenda items that are dealing with this issue. Uh, to allocate the uh, spectrum for 3G and 4G services. Um, and uh, the, there are already uh, some uh, groups uh, working on trying to find uh, available spectrum in order to be able to, to decide on its allocation. For instance, in Region 1, as uh, America's region is, is, is called in the radio sector, uh, has uh, created a task force where users of, uh, users of uh, spectrum like uh, satellite operators, broadcasters and mobile operators are looking into uh, areas of the spectrum that could be uh, released um, and uh, could be reallocated for new services. I'd like to, to take a, a couple of questions coming in mm -hmm. uh, from uh, those who joined us today. Um, one is, or well the first one I see is, how much difference can regulators really make when so much power is now concentrated mm. in over-the-top players who are often not subject to the same regulatory constraints as the traditional telcos? I don't know which of you would like to have a go, or maybe both of you. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, this is a concern, mm. certainly. And this is something where um, it is, it is an area where we see that collaboration and international cooperation and collaboration among uh, regulators is key. This is where you, you need it. It really highlights that the what we were saying, the transnational aspects of regulation today. Countries cannot operate in a silo. I mean, they are not alone. They can't just be operating in their own country. They need to discuss, they need to exchange, and they need to develop with other, uh, with other uh, countries policies, mm -hmm. maybe, to address these issues. And certainly, the ITU and the GSR are venues where these, we provide the opportunities for regulators to see how they can best meet these concerns and address these concerns to ensure that these OTTs do not like, uh, um, how do you say, operate with uh, going pr providing anti-competitive uh, mm -hmm. practices, but that they do so in a transparent and fair environment and not at the de detriment of, um, of uh, t uh, traditional telecom operators. Questioning on, on the GSR, noting that civil society and uh, consumer groups are increasingly important, and we, we mentioned mm -hmm. that already. Uh, the question is, is there, is there provision for funding civil society to participate? I, I think not for funding, but certainly it's open uh, on day one to a civil society organisation, if I'm right, one that would be working in this area? Well, the GSR is, uh, main, uh, is, mm, is addressed to ITU members. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So either member states, which are the governments and the regulators, or what we call sector members, which is the private sector the academia and other organizations that are members of the ITU. Indeed, which includes some civil society which organizations. Which includes civil society, mm -hmm. but they have to be members in order to be able to participate in the event. Worth noting that uh, civil society organizations, I think, can join. Uh, often the membership fees are waived uh, in the case of smaller NGOs who may find it difficult to... Not that the membership fees are particularly high, but nonetheless, I know that ITU does sometimes do that. So I think we're trying to be as inclusive as we as can be mm -hmm. uh, in this event. Let's go back to the report uh, and look, Nancy, I wanted to ask you about global and regional IP interconnection. What does the report tell yeah. us about the trends in that area? I see three key, uh, key uh, main message uh, in this, uh, in this uh, s chapter. One of it is, the first one is that um, the, the development of an effective uh, global market for connectivity through the commercial agreements uh, for the exchange of I, uh, IP traffic has been key in the growth of internet and IP traffic that we are witnessing um, today. And uh, we see that the model of peer peering and transit is uh, very well understood um, by the majority of um, 
of companies as peering agreement can now be even be concluded uh, on a, a handshake basis mm -hmm. um, without even the need for a written uh, uh, document. This is what was one of the outcome of the, the chapter. Second, what we see is uh, what's important is to note the how the transnational um, internet connectivity market has uh, responded, in fact, to the changing uh, traffic mix by adding investment uh, in internet exchange point, for example, in content delivery networks, and in long-haul facilities, all of which, uh, in fact, help to improve service quality and uh, reduce costs and, uh, costs and prices. And IXP, in uh, particular, uh, have played a key role um, in the growth of the internet. And uh, the establishment of an IXP in country or in region can become part of what um, the report refers to as a virtual, s virtual circle of investment in internet assets, as it uh, may encourage further investment in backbone and local access networks, uh, IT-related businesses, and even encourage domestically pro uh, produced content. And third, what I see is really a key message that, re is that we can uh, see throughout the report is that countries with effective and liberalized policy frameworks are best positioned, in fact, to promote a virtual circle of investment and growth. Mm -hmm. Okay. Let's, let's go to a topic close to everyone's heart, I think, which is mobile roaming <laughs> costs. <laughs> Nancy mentioned that we did see this issue come up in Dubai and actually it made its way into the, the new international telecommunication regulations, mm -hmm. uh, provision for new uh, levels of transparency in mobile roaming costs. Uh, Mario, could I ask you, well, do you think that the, this inclusion in the ITRs will make any difference to consumers? Uh, haven't telcos traditionally m built their bundled packages and service offerings in a very complex way that makes it almost impossible for anyone to work out what they're paying? Mm -hmm. Well, um, it's, a, it's a difficult uh, issue. Uh, because it's uh, what was good about the, the, the discussion in Dubai about the international telecommunication regulator re regulations is that it was clear to everybody that the re retail uh, prices for mobile roaming uh, remain very high. But not only that, they are not, uh, they don't have any relationship with the costs uh, of the mobile communications in the home country mm -hmm. and uh, even worse they are not related at all to the costs uh, at all seen as a, as a cash cow is it exactly. that uh, if you're if you're wealthy enough to travel we can also hit you for some additional and telecoms and, uh, charges and you don't have any choice <laughs> because at the end of the day when you normally when you choose your operator at home then you look at the package they offer you mm -hmm. for the national le yeah. services mm -hmm. let's say because it's uh, what you are going to be using 90% of the time. So nobody is looking at uh, the cost of uh, the roaming uh, when they choose their, their national uh, carrier. So the problem is then the surprise when you, when you travel, as, as uh, Nancy mm -hmm. was saying earlier, and the, the bill shock uh, that yes. is called when you come back. Uh, so um, here is when where the transnational issues uh, come, when regulators can try to work, uh, let's say, with uh, the other uh, regulators in other countries of the world in order to try to uh, put a limit uh, to this kind of, uh, to put a cap huh, to this kind of prices in a, in a bilateral agreement or multilateral agreement. Uh, for the time being, what is being done is trying to empower the, the consumer by being more transparent uh, with the costs, uh, that at least when you go to a given country, then you will get some uh, messages on your phone saying welcome uh, to whatever operator you are mm -hmm. connected to and these are the prices that you will uh, find here so that you at least uh, don't have the bill shock. You mm -hmm. know what you are going to pay and you can eventually uh, look for other carriers in the same country that would be more uh, competitive. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm. But it's still an open issue. Nancy, let's go back to uh, the GSR. And I remember from last year's event that cloud computing was probably the hottest mm -hmm. topic. It came up over and over again. Could you explain some of the issues around mm -hmm. that technology? Why is it generating so much debate? Mm -hmm. um, it is ger generating a lot of debate because it uh, relates to information, personal information and data that you may be storing somewhere in the cloud, somewhere that you don't, you're not sure where it is hosted. 
you don't know exactly what, how you will get access to this information if you want to delete something. If you want to take the case, for example, of pictures that you could put on the social networks and you would like to delete, you don't know how to do that. Consumers are, may not be educated on the, how to address these issues. They may not always read what are the <laughs> rights and obligations mm -hmm. that they sign when they submit or they, they join a, um, a network. And also what we're saying, is, uh, we're seeing is that there is what data protection laws that have been uh, uh, adopted, have been adopted in the era when internet was not around, mm. in the time where internet was not around. So they don't really match the need of uh, to today's environment and the uh, data protection and privacy issues of, uh, of a digital environment. The issue is not just for the consumers, but it is also for the businesses and governments. If you want to host information on the cloud, uh, then you need to make sure that uh, you know where it is hosted and you need to want you need to make sure as well that you it, you will it will be your access will be secured that you will uh, that you will need to have always on access but also that if you want to move your uh, server or if you want to move your information or your data from one uh, one cloud uh, computing uh, one cloud provider that, that you can be able to do so so the interoperability is also an issue that is not uh, uh, that may be a concern for uh, not only the the, the users the end users like you and me, but mm. also for the, for the businesses. But uh, there is no question that cloud computing has a lot of uh, cloud uh, services, and cloud computing brings a lot of benefit um, for the for the government, for the businesses, and also for the citizens. But what is really needed right now is a, the right framework to ensure um, rights are protected, to ensure that those are using your data are not selling your data without you being aware of that, mm. that you at least get the benefit of uh, the, the information that you provide. And I think that the one of the dangers is really that people are, or maybe the younger generation now, are used to putting information and displaying any kind of information out there, but without noticing that it, it is personal information. And that personal information that is there might be there and might stay there. I notice, <coughs> in fact, I think we're all aware that the, the data mining uh, systems mm. that are being developed are incredibly yeah, sophisticated now. Mm -hmm. I, I read a, an article a couple of weeks ago on, on a company that had just trawled through people's public Facebook sites and had mm -hmm. been incredibly accurate in predicting various elements of their consumer behavior, or orientation, all sorts of things about them that I think people would that were not explicitly declared and mm -hmm. they, they specifically looked at sites where it was not specifically declared. So Mario, do you think that data privacy is sufficiently well addressed uh, and do you think that consumers are getting the levels of protection they deserve and do you think they're naive at the moment about the levels of privacy they still have? Absolutely. Uh, this is one of these uh, transnational issues mm -hmm. that uh, if a global effort is not undertaken, uh, they will n it will never be solved. Because as, as Nancy was saying, uh, the, the, the provider of the service is not in the same country as the user of the service, and maybe not in the same country as the, as the storage of the data uh, is situated. So uh, the only way to have some uh, consistent, let's say, uh, legislation policy framework for this is to have a a transnational agreement, a global agreement on these kind of issues. So I do believe that uh, as older people might be more careful about the privacy of the data and that's why maybe they don't uh, feel at ease with these new applications mm -hmm. and then don't use it. The younger generation are mm -hmm. totally naive mm -hmm. about them and uh, they are not only the object of uh, this kind of scamming uh, but mm -hmm. also the object of much more serious issues like uh, you know cyber threats and mm -hmm. uh, and uh, cyber criminality so uh, the important message here is that we shouldn't be saying that this is not to be used mm -hmm. or this is not to be developed because this is it is really the really the future but that we have to work together all all of us mm -hmm. all the world has to work together towards uh, defining a framework and enforcing it uh, in a global way we have some more questions coming over mm -hmm. Adobe Connect. Uh, one from Carla, and this one's a specific uh, national question, perhaps not a surprising one given the, the mm -hmm. uh, momentous development. She says, in Mexico, we are living in a process of uh, uh, reform in telecommunication laws. 
What are the topics that the Mexican government would need to consider when undertaking such a big uh, reform? Well, to understand what, it is, what is exactly the reform they are undertaking, is it to create a converge regulator? Is it to address um, media uh, under the same umbrella as uh, the telecom? Um, we would need to know a little bit more what is exactly but, uh, the, the, the current reform taking place. But what we could say is that certainly all of the issues that have been uh, discussed in the past GSR and in the past edition of Trends and all some of the best practices that have been adopted certainly provide guidance for regulators to understand what are, what, have, what, are, what other countries have done in areas such as expanding the mandate of the regulator, such as um, what are some of the measures to uh, consider in, uh, let's say in, a, in this new uh, environment we're living in. What is it about open access, how to ensure infrastructure sharing, how to ensure that more um, services becomes more affordable and more that ro rollout of uh, networks, broadband networks, are being done in a more efficient manner. So these are all the issues that we certainly can consider. But it's uh, what we've we I, um, I don't know exactly what is the particular reform that is taking place in Mexico right mm -hmm. now. But uh, what we've seen as a trend, curr a current trend, is like yes, expanding the mandate of the regulator to cover not not just tel pure telecom uh, sector in the traditional telecom sector, but expanding to include broadcasting, and even include broadcasting content, mm -hmm. media, uh, internet uh, issues, cybersecurity. So this often uh, th it requires an institutional change in, in the, um, the design of the regulatory authority, but also requires changes in the laws and, and the legislation and regulations that are uh, governing the sector. That convergence has really accelerated, I think. We've all seen that. I notice now with my own stepsons that they spend just as much time watching television content on their computers as they mm -hmm. probably do, maybe more mm -hmm. uh, in their rooms than they do watching it on TV now. So broadcasting and telecoms really have mm -hmm. come Absolutely. together. So mm -hmm. it's very difficult now to say mm -hmm. who is regulating the content if you are looking at it mm -hmm. uh, in your computer. Mm -hmm. So it's a broadcasting uh, issue or it's a <laughs> uh, telecom issue or it's an ICT. So uh, that's why this uh, tendency to, to have converged uh, regulators, which is a regulator with a bigger mandate. And uh, the more the ICTs uh, permeate the other areas of the economy, uh, then the more this issue will uh, come uh, into play. Uh, as we know, the, uh, the ICTs are being used now in order to provide health uh, services, education services, agricultural services. Uh, to all uh, the, the, the population, so it's across, uh, it's more and more across uh, sector uh, activity. So this is an increasing um, challenge for uh, the regulators. This issue of cybersecurity, as Nancy was mentioning, uh, that is also being put on the shoulders of the regulators, so who takes care of these cyber threats, and uh, where is the framework, and uh, how do we enforce it together with the police and the judiciary system, is another added uh, responsibility for the regulators because many of the of the scams or of the let's say uh, um, uh, criminal acts that you mentioned uh, using data or accessing people they in many countries mainly developing countries they are not even mm. in the legislatory framework they are not even characterized as, as a crime mm. so we have to update all this framework and in order for them to be crimes and then to be pursued. Uh, nowadays, uh, they, some of them, they don't even exist in the, in the legislations of, the, of many countries. I can uh, imagine if you've picked up the uh, GSR program, Nancy, that's because you have a session <laughs> on this <laughs> at the forthcoming GSR. Exactly. Um, we are going to have a session on fourth generation regulation mm -hmm. and also a session that's going to entitled moving to the next level, looking at new apps and new delivery platforms. and the role of broadcasting uh, and audiovisual and online content, who's in, who's in charge? Is it the broadcasting authorities? Should it be the ra telecom regulator? Are the new mechanism? What, who should be doing what? And so these are really pertinent questions that are really putting the, the regulators and the market in front of uh, new issues. Mm. And in fact, this is why we've uh, said that this year we're going to be looking at fourth generation regulation because in a converged environment, there are many things that need to be done uh, from a regulatory perspective uh, to not only um, inf raise awareness of regulators of some of the issues that may they may not be 
dealing with today, like cybersecurity, may have been uh, may not, may have not been in the mandate of the ra of many regulators mm -hmm. like five years ago, and you see we see now that Mario mentioned that increasingly it is becoming part of their mandate. So another aspect is like yes, co on the media content and also like financial services, for example, is mm -hmm. another issue. Uh, when we see that a lot of uh, more and more. Uh, financial uh, um, digital transactions are being carried out over using mobile networks, fixed networks. So who should be in charge of wh when there is an issue? Who is responsible? Who should be looking after these questions? And providing guidance, not only to the market players, but also to consumers. Mm. And if, uh, as I mentioned at the beginning, co um, consumer education and awareness is, I think, going to be a very important uh, issue in the coming years. Interesting. We have uh, two questions coming in. Both of them uh, relate to Latin America from uh, Cesar Salvucci. Uh, he says, are there any specific challenges for Latin America's regulators? Well, I think the, the challenges are uh, those that are common to all uh, developing countries. Um, um, the issue is how to uh, become from a, uh, let's say, police uh, type of regulator, uh, somebody that is uh, looking at the rules and enforcing them so that all the market uh, players respect them, to now become a partner uh, of these market players, of these um, operators and service providers for to, to facilitate uh, the provision of uh, services to the whole uh, of the population. So this is the change of paradigm in Latin America and in other developing countries where the first step uh, has been accomplished. That means the sector is open. We have several players, be them public or private, um, or a mix of both. And uh, the, 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 let's say there is a reasonable um, uh, penetration rate in urban areas and in the for the business purposes and all that. But we have... Uh, uh, parts of the population, let's call it that way, that are still underserved. Mm -hmm. So people in rural areas, people in underserved areas, people tha that are um, uh, uh, minorities like indigenous people. In Latin America, this is an issue uh, particularly, but also, uh, let's say, people with disabilities or uh, women and, 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 and youth. So all these uh, part of the population that are not uh, accessing uh, services or that are accessing a very restricted, let's say, um, uh, package of these services have to uh, be, let's say, helped uh, to get uh, accessibility and uh, to, to be able to be connected and to get not only voice, that was the old, uh, let's say, ambition, but to get really broadband, to get internet in order for them to get access to information, to education, to health services, and to all these services. So the regulator has now shifted or has to shift from uh, just a controller to an enabler to a partner of these, uh, let's say, market uh, players in order to ensure that this rollout of services is done uh, for all. Uh, another question, this one is from Alejandro Gutierrez uh, in Colombia. He mentions that Colombia is, is um, about to have a 4G uh, auction and he wonders if there are best practices that uh, you would recommend for uh, the implementation of this service to be successful and he says to incentivize competition in OTT markets. Is there a, a kind of best practice framework that uh, the GSR has come mm -hmm. up with for we had a uh, we did we did a paper last uh, last year um, no two years ago sorry on a spectrum valuation and on auctioning and how to conduct uh, that refers to different um, auctioning mechanisms mm -hmm. uh, and it was it may provide some useful guidance and best practices guidelines were also developed for spectrum looking at spectrum management and how to ensure that the conditions are there to ensure that the the, the auctioning f uh, is carried out well mm -hmm. for the benefit of the end users afterwards um, with regard to uh, OTTs uh, this is an interesting question. What we do see is that some of the OTTs, and I, I don't, I'm not too sure if this is what he is refer, uh, <laughs> referring to, uh, are now trying also to enter the mobile market, to enter the more tradi the, the traditional, let's say the the the, the network, the infrastructure market. Mm -hmm. So this is a new. This is a, this is new. This is a, ch a change as well. So. But ac according to the current uh, regulatory uh, practice and environment, they should be sub they should be treated as uh, any other uh, 
players uh, that is that is willing to enter the the market and uh, to uh, to launch the auction to join the auctioning. So the documents you mentioned can uh, can media and analysts find those online? Are they sure, uh, sure, and I can uh, certainly provide uh, the provide you with the link to okay. that document Fantastic. and to the best practice guidelines. Fantastic, thank you. W I think we've got time just for one last question. We've only got a couple of minutes left, uh, and I have one in. It says last mile delivery access to rural areas has always been a major mm. challenge and remains a major challenge. What should regulators look at uh, in terms of building an ecosystem that would uh, look to delivery of services and focus on availability of low cost devices and rich local content with local low tariffs? Mm. It's a big ask, but I guess a lot of countries face this challenge. Um, even developed countries like my own, Australia, where we have a a very remote uh, rural population, difficult to mm -hmm. serve, but some European countries also face that, and of course, many developing countries. Yes, well, there are several measures that can be taken, and in fact, uh, there is a mix of measures that probably is the best uh, approach. So uh, some of them are related to, uh, let's say, subsidize the um, infrastructure development to the rural areas, and for that, there is uh, normally universal service funds that are in, uh, established in, uh, in all countries, where all the operators that uh, have licenses to provide services, telecommunication services, that are not providers of uh, universal service, uh, they contribute to the fund. So the fund uh, can be managed by the regulator in order to uh, facilitate access to those that don't have. Uh, another possibility is uh, to promote infrastructure sharing that means that when we build either between operators themselves, so that when we build infrastructure to uh, the rural areas, it is shared by uh, several operators so that the cost is divided among all of them, or even uh, sharing between different, uh, let's say, areas like energy and telecommunications. So when you land a cable for uh, telecommunications or for uh, electricity, you do uh, the telecommunications one uh, together so that the costs of this, uh, let's say, um, uh, infrastructure building is shared between the two aspects. That's another example. Uh, another possibility is also to uh, have uh, public partner uh, partnerships, which is in fashion now. Mm -hmm. um, in many developed countries, as Australia is an example that you mentioned, the government has realized that uh, the private sector initiative has a limit. So uh, uh, in the past it was said, well, leave, leave it to the private sector, they will do it. If there is a, a business uh, case, mm. they will uh, go for it. And there is a limit for that. So when we want the broadband for all, uh, it's not happening. So uh, then the Australian government has uh, entered into this public-private partnership and is investing money in order to ensure that this broadband rollout is, is uh, carried out and uh, is, is a partner with the private sector in order for it to happen. So it's a developed country and, uh, and the market forces alone are not uh, guaranteeing this uh, service for all, so they, they stepped in. Uh, uh, obviously, um, the mix of all these uh, ideas uh, can be, uh, let's say, m a good uh, solution for that. Uh, regarding the, the low-cost solutions that was mentioned, I think, by the person that asked the question, there are more and more of such mm -hmm. solutions that are coming to the, to the market with the advance of technology, and we can now have uh, very, uh, let's say, low-cost uh, solutions for wireless connectivity of rural areas, where you can have a, a central cell, let's say, and uh, all the village can connect to this cell uh, wirelessly without uh, major cost. The most important thing here is to have the community buy-in into this uh, solution. So be it uh, a telecenter mode or be it uh, in the village library or school or whatever solution or even a private uh, kind of um, endeavor, the important thing is that the whole village buys into this solution and they all contribute to its uh, sustainability. Because we have been helping in many of these uh, uh, pilot projects in order to show the, the, the viability of these uh, solutions. But uh, if, the, if the community doesn't get, en get engaged and, uh, and they involve themselves in, the, in not only the use, but also the maintenance and the improvement 
of these uh, technical solutions, they will just uh, the, um, uh, drain down when, when the, let's say, provider of the solution, uh, you know, falls back. So it's important that the solutions are there, the ways of bringing connectivity are there, but it's important that they embrace it at the community to have level. That exactly. Community buy-in, that community investment. In exactly, the and for that, I think content was mentioned also in the in the question. For that, local content, relevant content for the local people is key. That's the driver for absolutely uh, for because the that's what be they valuable. are going to look for. Mm. We're over time. I think we're going to have to wrap it up. I'd like to thank Mario Manjewitz and Nancy Sundberg for joining us today. I'd like to remind everyone as well that the press release accompanying this launch is available uh, directly for download off the Adobe Connect website, also the executive uh, summary and the full report. If you have any follow-up questions, of course, don't hesitate to get in touch. And an archive of this uh, webinar will be available on the ITU uh, newsroom in about an hour's time. Thanks very much indeed for joining us.